welcoming you back to Weekend Walkabout, and where we're in our gardens and ears virtually from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Janet McConovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. And we're talking about dividing perennials, and in Chapter 3, the most asked questions that we get, which are written for you on the outline that you can download from our website on the webinars page, are, the book says you have to divide it in a certain month. Everybody asks that. Yeah, all, they always say, oh, but I've got to do it. Yeah, it, you do not have to do anything at any time except what's best for you. But sometimes the uh, peony, for instance, they say do it in the fall. The roots are less brittle in the fall. They don't They're, break as easily. They don't break as easily. But if you talk to the peony growers, they're busy digging things up and moving them all year, including when the peonies are in bloom. We've moved them when they're in bloom. Um, it just You just have to support the stems better when you move them after they're done. Um, it might be that you're recommended to move things at a certain <coughs> time, like the irises that I was telling you about during chapter two, that it might be that if you divide them in July, you are better able to control the iris borer. But there's no reason that you can't do it at any time that you feel you can do it. So bleeding heart, which we saw the roots of just a little bit ago. In right after it goes down, see how tiny those buds are Dude. by my finger. You almost can't see the buds that are there. It's a small pointer, so make sure you move it a lot. All right, there's some right, there's one there, there's there. If you there. wait until fall to, to divide that, those buds are big and eat more easily knocked off. So might be better for, somebody who's unsure of themselves to do it when it's just gone down. But still no reason you can't do it another time. Um, if the books say don't disturb it, it presents disturbance, don't, don't move it. I've had people say that about hellebores. We've been busy chopping up hellebores. Peonies, they say, oh, don't disturb a peony. How in the heck can they produce peonies if you don't disturb them? Yeah, millions of peonies they sell every year. They must be disturbing peonies somewhere. We spoke at a conference in Wisconsin um, and I was speaking about garden maintenance and someone asked about peonies and when to move them. I said, whenever you feel like it. Right after me, Roy Clem from Song Sparrow Nursery came up to speak and Roy is a second, third generation peony hybridizer, wonderful peonies. Um, and he's been at it for he's a, long a long, long time. He said what she said, he said exactly. He said in, in June when the peonies are blooming, we send our workers out into the field because we grow them in acres. We grow them like acres. acres of peonies. Our workers go out into the field and the block of peonies that's supposed to be the white ones with the red flecks, if there's a pink one in there, they pull the peony. That's our procedure, pull the peony. They pull it. They pull it out and they lay it down in the path in the middle. They don't try to find where it's supposed to go. They just take the wrong ones out of the block and lay them down. At the end of the day, the farm tra tractor comes back out to pick everybody up, pulling a trailer. Everybody jumps onto the trailer and they throw the peonies that they pulled onto the trailer and they all ride back to the farm on top of the peonies. When they get back to the, the barn, the peonies get composted, but some of them, the workers take home and plant and they grow. They were pulled up, pulled up in bloom, left lay in the sun all day long, sat upon on, and they still grow. He said, there's no reason that you can't do that. So um, go ahead and put it. But the plants might salt. They might say. Sure, they might. Eh. A great story we heard from two people that we shouldn't. They, uh, they own a, a large nursery, uh, a large perennial nursery. And it's been a long, many years since I heard the story. And I might have exaggerated it, so I won't say her name. But she wanted to move this plant. And he said, no, 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 you can't mess with that. You can't disturb monkshood. It, it, it presents disturbance. But one day while he was gone, well, actually, he was gone for the week. She he said, that's it. That's it. I'm moving that plant. It's got to be in a different place. So she dug it up and very, she was being very careful with the roots and she dropped it. It was a big clump on the way to where it goes and it shattered the roots. They were all in all pieces. She planted every one of them and every one of them grew and the two of them um, had it out and then started moving them around. So <laughs> Baptisia, that took me an hour to get that Baptisia out of the ground. It had been in the ground about six years. And I've cut the roots. You can probably see there the ends are cut at uh, still almost, almost a half an inch around. They probably went a long way into the ground. But it took me an hour to get that thing out of the ground. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't disturb with Baptisia because your back will hate it. It took a saw. I cut it into about seven big pieces. I sawed it apart and, and moved it. So, but you can do it. People also ask, do I have to lift the whole plant? No, you don't. You can reach in you there and slice into it. Use your spade and just slice into it if yeah. you wanted to. But it's always it's always better to 
um, leave room for the remaining plant that's in the ground to grow. So it's always better to divide the whole thing. But if you've got something as big as a hibiscus, this is a grower showing us the, what he's looking for in the hibiscus blooms. The thing's six feet tall, it's four feet across, and its root system, even cut, fills a wheelbarrow like that. Sure, you can take a, a sharp spade and go into the center of the plant and cut down really hard and cut a pie-shaped piece out of that, and you'll probably get the top and a the roots. to grow. But it's, that's a woody uh, cluster just like the butterfly bush I showed you, and chances are that you might also cut off some pieces that don't have roots on them. Um, you're not gonna make as good a job it, of it. So if you lift the whole thing out, you could see so much better what you are going to do, what you want to do with the plant. Yep. You also could see the rotted roots and things. Yeah, you can get rid of the parts you shouldn't do. And when it's out of the ground, you have the opportunity to use the two forks. Put one fork in, put the other one back to back, push them apart, push them apart. So it's breaking this peony into two. And that doesn't work unless it's out of the ground. You can't do that when it's in the ground. You have to have the clump out of the ground. So this day lily, I put the fork in, put a fork backwards, now I'm pushing them apart. So I now have two big clumps. If I cut it apart, I cut like you saw on the hellebore and I end up with a lot of roots that need to be taken out of there or should be taken out of there because mm -hmm. they're not doing any good for anybody. Um, whereas if I pull them apart, I get intact roots. See, I don't have a lot of cut pieces there. Do you worry about diseases and insect spreading? Yes. yes. Um, because if the original plant had a significant problem, you've just moved it. Um, you can move good, if you've got a, a healthy plant that's growing vigorously and doesn't have a big problem, you're moving not only any problems it might have, but you're also moving the beneficial stuff with it. But if there are problems that you see with the plant, rinse the roots and the crown thoroughly, clip the top back so you're not taking any of the foliage with it, discard whatever looks distorted or rotted, and in the case of a peony, that can mean taking a scraper and scraping out the bad parts and then swishing it around in some bleach yep. and water or some fungus, uh, some fungicide. And if the plant has any indication that it has a virus or nematodes, and that, what that is, is when, um, when the leaf is discolored or patterned, it doesn't die, but it has a strange pattern in it. It's called a virus or a mosaic. That's a pretty good indication you've got a virus, a virus. in the plant. Don't divide those plants because the whole plant is probably <clears throat> involved. When I move in uh, an iris, I'm in the middle of June, uh, in the middle of uh, in late June or early July, I'm feeling for soft it's spaces. It's spongy right there. You can almost see the shadow of her finger going into the ball, into the corn. It's ball. spongy right. there, and if I cut it out, I'll see that there's the guy right there. There's a borer, it's a caterpillar. He's in there eating, and where he eats, a, fun uh, a bacteria can get in and rot the bulb. And all of these things, if you look in propagation books, there's the fine gardening propagation video that we're, we're part of. Um, you'll find that in there, including in our Caring for Perennials. It tells you what problems they get and what to look for. Don't, don't divide and multiply your problems. Um, and if we're going to do um, more of this kind of stuff, those of you who are um, joining us today as part of a free webinar, uh, I, I hope that you will think about subscribing or donating to us because we have all of this material from other books that we've published that we still need to put up on our website and that we still need to put into webinars, but we need, we need the time to do that and it means we have to pay the bills um, yeah. some way. So subscribe or, or donate if you can. So I didn't bring my clock up to know what time it is. Do we have time for any more questions? It is exactly 10 o'clock. So we could uh, do a formal farewell and then stick around for, for questions. Sure, we'll do a formal farewell. Um, and I, I, can I also clarify, I think there will be a, a chat transcript. Um, oh, sure, there'll be a chat transcript. Sure. And for those who aren't subscribers, will they be able to find that on the website? Yes, we put all chat, thank you. We put all chat transcripts along with the outline of the webinars are up on the public part of our website. Everybody can get them. I'm sorry that they don't get up very quickly. Some of these chat transcripts take us, uh, take 12, 14 hours to put together by the time we look up the, the details that we wanna make clear for everybody. Um, and, and it is just the two of us. Right, and subscribers help us do that. Subscribe to our, our, our webinars or donate to the website if you can, because that lets us stay home to do it. But all chat material we put up there. Um, we still owe some people some chats. Um, we, our bulb chat from last week, 
we stopped in the middle when we realized that we needed to get a newsletter out yep. and warn people about vicious spreading bulbs. But and the newsletter to try and, and yeah. So go to our go to our website, go to webinar audience materials. You'll find both the outline and if there is a chat transcript, the chat transcript there um, by the uh, scrolling down by that webinar. Yeah, some webinars yep. didn't have a chat transcript. Well, uh, a question just uh, Jan's asking in the chat how you subscribe. If you go to gardena2z.org and you look for the webinars section, there's a, um, a link for subscribing there. And then we have some plant specific questions that we'll either save for maybe an article or I'll encourage people that at gardena2z.org, you can search. Uh, it's a searchable site and so you can search for your specific plant that you're interested in to see if there's already some articles up. Thank you. Okay. So Okay, let's let's uh, do those process questions. Great. Okay, so you had mentioned uh, putting compost in as your fill when you replant, um, but there were some questions about do we need to actually fertilize the cuttings when you plant or throw them? You do not need to fertilize the cuttings when you throw them. They are um, they are making their own nutrients, and the compost is adding the organic material that came out, which ends up becoming nutrients. If you fertilize uh, when you make a, any kind of a division, remember that water-soluble nitrogen can induce rot, and you've just cut a plant and you've left a, a surface open. So don't use water-soluble fertilizer on something you've just moved. Use a slow-release fertilizer or compost, which is a slow, slow-release fertilizer. Great. Um, and just for uh, clarification, Debbie was asking, is it best practice to actually take the plant out of the soil to divide? And maybe part of that is, should you be taking as much soil as possible off the plant when you divide? Um, it, we always think it's better to take the whole plant out when you're seriously dividing it. If you're just poaching a piece of it to move it someplace else, go ahead and nip in. Or giving somebody a quick piece. But if the plant has told you it needs to be divided <laughs> because the center's dying out, or it's getting crowded by something else, it's, it's always a better idea to take the entire thing out. Um, do you need to take the soil off of it? No, I was taking soil off and rinsing it off specifically for your benefit so you could see the eyes and the roots, but you can leave the soil on there. We know what the root structures are like. We didn't need necessarily need any more to, to rinse all the soil off, and sometimes the soil has a lot of benefit Special things in them. Right. If you right, if you knew it came from a good place and was growing well, the soil is not a problem. If, if it's bad, you get rid of it. If it's iffy, yep, I'm going to get rid of every bit of soil. I'm going to if if I have any question about where I'm moving a plant from, if I'm moving it from a garden that I don't know or I don't know what might be in it, I'm going to rinse the living daylights out of it to make sure I don't take anything. And you don't know what seed bank is in there. You could be bringing bindweed in. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's what growers do for you is they clean them up all the way. Right. Um, Mary and Stacy had sort of uh, uh, compatible questions about, do you cut off any of the roots to make them fit uh, in, in the, the new hole? And do you cut off any old flowers to give energy to the roots? So is there any trimming involved on either end? We, uh, we will often trim roots um, and we'll trim roots that are broken for sure. Anything broken is just not of use to the plant and is going to be a drain on the plant. It's much better to have a nice smooth cut Right. Than a and and yes, we'll trim roots to make it easier to to replant. There's no reason that we have to plant a root that goes four feet and off to the side. Um, so yes, we often trim roots, and growers trim roots all the time because it is the growing part, the shoot, that's making the energy. Um, do we have to trim it? Do we trim the flowers off? Not necessarily. Um, there, you'll see in a lot of books that said take the flowers off. You know, it shouldn't shouldn't divide it in flower. Take the flowers off. We have taken the flowers off and not taken the flowers off of things when we moved them, like peonies that we moved in bloom uh, and divided in bloom, uh, pulsatilla or past flower that we divided in bloom, uh, 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 budlia, butterfly bush. And, and in all cases, it didn't seem to make any difference that we took the flower off. So I think it might be one of those things that sounds good but make may not, sense, but not be but may actually not be, doing it. Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, what's the latest, Mark asks, what's the latest that perennials can be divided in Michigan? Well, um, a lot of authorities and, and reference books and whatever will tell you, oh, well, you got to do this by October 1st. Um, we start dividing the middle of August. We finish dividing 
when the cold chases us in in early December. Um, if you're putting something in the ground that is you're afraid is going to pop out of the ground, right? That might that's different. That that's the difference between trans dividing and and planting new. Planting new, you've got old different soil and it could pop out of the ground easy just with, like a cork it with a, out of the ground with a transplant you're using your own soil to keep it down yeah so we we don't have any problem with transplanting and, and dividing quite late into the year there are also a lot of things that are still carryovers from way back when in colonial times when people said man it gets really cold here in the winter time and they didn't know they didn't know what would happen if you transplanted late they came from a, the european continental uh, moderated climate and they said oh you better be really careful and that just kept getting passed down so we we do it until the ground freezes basically uh -oh. sorry it was uh, nope just it was just typing in the in the chat um I, uh, just uh let's see i think that's actually about it for the process questions now we've got some things that are uh more related to individual plants do you guys want to want to hang out Sure, um, because I'm going to go back to where I can go to our individual plant pictures. Stephen is leaving to go and do something else, and I'm going to the pictures page, which takes me a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah. What questions do we have about individual plants? Okay, great. Um, so Judith is asking, someone gave me iris rhizomes in the summer, but I didn't have time to plant them. Would they still be viable even though they're dry? I said, I mean, why not try? But I don't know if you have uh, a diagnosis there. Diagnosis. They, they, they probably will still be fine. I've seen irises sit out for more than a year and still, uh, and then because they're uh, able to hold a lot of moisture inside that nice brown coating, um, they'll grow for a long time. So it, they'll probably be fine. Great. Uh, a quick follow-up from earlier. We were talking about Ditsia and whether it can be uh, moved. Janet is also curious about when would be ideal to move it? Um, well, I, I would I would consider ideal on Dutzia to be um, after the leaves fall and before they start growing in the spring, just so that when it goes back in, it keeps all its foliage and all its leaves and doesn't look disheveled because you're going to pick it up and move it. You're sometimes breaking branches. You put it in at a different angle, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Uh, so we have a question about C. Um Karen is curious, since it has that deep tap root, if you break off a piece with no roots on it, could it still be planted? And this and is- I go for tap roots generally. Did you say this was oregano, what? Uh, oregano, uh, sea holly. Oh, oh, um, um, that's a, a, a tap rooted plant. And just like the um, balloon flowers and uh, euphorbias, it's a tap root like so. And you can either take the top part that's got buds and just separate a part that has buds from a part that has buds and let them grow. Or you can take the root itself on the sea holly and I can take this tap part, which is similar to the balloon flower here, and I can cut and cut and cut and cut it into like one inch and two inch pieces and just put those pieces in the ground and they will grow too because there are buds all the way down, these little bumps that you see on a tap, on a true tap root, those bumps, if they're close enough to the soil and they're the top, can become a new stem and new roots will grow from the ones down below. So you can just divide this piece even this far down, you can see the bumps on it. And the same thing with the uh, uh, origer, uh, um, the origerons, the sea hollies. So Great. tap rooted plants. Great. Um, Roberta is asking about hardy orchids. Do they have multiple buds for dividing or do they have single buds each year? Are they similar to the bleeding heart that you divided? Um, I'm trying to think of what hardy orchids. Um, the only ones in the orchid family that we deal with that are hardy are the toad lilies and their rhizomatis. So I don't think I can answer that question because I don't know any others that would, that would fit the bill. Um, that wouldn't yeah. be real obvious. You take it out and they just have a bud sitting right on the, um, so I, I can't answer that one. Okay, great. Uh, Ron has his hand up. Ron, do you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a question you mentioned earlier on about iris borer and the June, July is the right time to do it. And then you talked about how they lay their eggs. 
does that mean I don't have to worry about them laying eggs on any mulch? I don't have to, all I have to do is remove the uh, leaf litter? Exactly. Um, ex well, we, you want to get rid of the, um, you want to get rid of any part that have borers in them in July because then you don't have the adult, adult to pupate and come out and lay eggs in the fall. But you definitely, anytime in the fall, any, anytime now, cut all this foliage off because any eggs that were laid are on that foliage. Take that foliage out of the garden, hot compost it, or send it to a, a yard waste place to be hot composted, and you're rid of the eggs. Um, so do that. Sometimes if you cut them back in September because you're cleaning up the garden early and they look like this and you want to get rid of some of them, they grow new shoots that still got, um, that, <coughs> that were green in the fall, and there were still caterpillar uh, moth borers flying then in the spring, you would cut again, real early in the year, just cut, cut that part back that was green and take it out of the garden. And if you do that, you don't ever have to do the dusting for um, using insecticide, et cetera. Um, not if you keep your iris garden clean. Does that, does that answer that question? I guess the question is a different question. So if, yeah, you answered that question well, but I guess the question do you, can I use mulch on iris or do I have a problem oh, with them laying? Yeah, yes, you can use mulch on iris. A lot of a lot of books tell you that they like to have their backs up and leave this part um, up. I, I have not seen that that really makes a difference. The plants on their own squeeze themselves up out of the ground, but you can put mulch over the top of them. I don't put it on onto the leaves because it just makes it that much easier for um, borers to, to move around when they're little caterpillars. So I, I don't mulch them heavily, but I do mulch right up to where the points are coming out from iris. And these guys are covered, these backs, these rhizomes are covered. Okay, because I, I used, I used uh, wood chip mulch and I put a thin layer on just to keep the weeds down. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that was okay. Yeah, because weeds in iris are awful. We, <laughs> when an iris bed gets weedy, we have an iris bed that we're taking care of for a client that has a, a bulb allium growing in it and it is just madness. Mm -hmm try to keep them apart. We have to keep dividing the iris just to get the bulbs out. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Great. Um, okay, so we also have a question um, about uh, ornamental rhubarb, uh, Dharmara. What time, types of division would these need? Uh, or umbrella plant and ornamental rhubarb. Yeah, Dharmara or, or um, I guess that's called ornamental rhubarb, Dharmara. Um, some people I think call it Japanese rhubarb. It, it is a crown like hosta. I guess I should have stayed on hosta. It's a thick crown with um, offsets that are close in. So just like this, you have your dharmara, but it's a very hard plate between them. It definitely takes a knife or a saw um, uh, to, to, to break between the two of them and break them, but it's, it's just the same, just on a bigger scale than what you see right here. You're going to move off a piece that has its own roots. Um, and they're murder to dig up because they're big. Um, <laughs> um, when they've been in the ground for a while, you've got a big root system. Yeah, as long as you get new roots, so you see on this hosta here, and the same thing be going on with the Dharmaras, it's this shoot. Next year's shoot is there. This is late in the, uh, this is in, in the fall. The shoot is inside right here. It's in a bud. And it's already photosynthesizing, and it is causing this new root growth that you see coming right from the bud. New buds, new roots right there. Dharma is doing the same thing. And when you get it out of the ground, you can take just that part and make it into a new plant. Um, so you can cut small, a small root system on it. You can cut a small root ball, but it's still a big, heavy, clunky thing that you got to get out of the ground. Uh, Judith is asking, she has a gorgeous hibiscus, which for the last two years has had a pest which reduced the foliage to lace. Is this safe to divide? Uh, she said, um, Janet yeah. thought the pest was a tiny worm, not disease. Yeah, there's a, there is a, a butylon moth that lives on it that eats the leaves. And um, it, generally, because hibiscus grows so quickly, even though it loses a lot of leaf to that moth, it still makes a lot of starch and is growing bigger. It just looks bad when the leaves are all eaten like that. So go ahead and dig it up and move it. And sometimes when you move it to a better place, we had a, our first hibiscus that we planted. It said it could handle part shade. So I put it in the part shade and the uh, Japanese beetles just ate the living daylights out of it. So after two years, I said, well, this is ridiculous. And I dug it up, looked at it and said, well, it's got good roots. 
I moved it about 40 feet out into the full sun and it was not eaten afterwards. So you might find that if you move it to a different place, you don't see as much damage. What you need on the hibiscus is you need the, the eyes are growing, are forming at the base of the last year's stems. So I need to cut through to get stem, stem base and roots um, when I move it. And then you've got another plant. So that is gonna form. That was an offset off of the left-hand one. And those are the old stems. And there's the roots. They cut it away and you've got the roots in the top part of it. Ta-da. Uh, we've got we've got three more uh, plant specific requests, but I'm noticing that dogs and dog sitters are now starting to uh, to wander through. So I don't know if we need to let you go. <laughs> You've been at it for a while. Yeah. Well, the dog yeah the dog sitters have been released, so we can take we can take two more questions. How about two more? Okay, great. Um, so question about Amsonia. Do you have Amsonia on your list? I oh, it's not there. I don't okay. have pictures of Amsonia, but we can. Do what it. about flocks? Flocks will work. Flocks and turtlehead are our two left. Okay, so flocks, tall flocks, like these. Um, this is too many stems, and this flocks, any, and this many stems um, next year is going to make three times as many stems, be way too crowded, and get more mildew, even if it's mildew resistant. So you're going to divide it to where you where see one old stem right there in the middle has made two, and often three new stems. That's as much as I'm going to put in when I divide it nice new vigorous outside pieces with just two or three um, um, stems coming up, then you don't get this problem where these have been repeatedly attacked by mildew. These old stems are getting worse and worse. So I want to take it down to just a couple of pieces. That's all. So all you put in in a flox. And many floxes will grow from if you leave it, when you dig it out, if you leave these pieces in the ground, a lot of floxes will grow from root cutting, so you'll find your flox coming back. People have a hard time getting rid of it sometimes because they don't realize that these pieces can grow back. So if, when you dig it out, if you don't want root pieces growing back, dig out the whole thing or as much of the whole thing as you can. Okay, and then was turtle head there? Yes, it was. And, that's, and that'll do it. Okay, um, still blooming. And so we're often dividing it in bloom. It is a, uh, a rhizomatous plant, a runner. See the runner coming here just below ground. And once it gets out from underneath the leaves, it's turning up and growing. This piece clipped apart will grow by itself. This piece clipped apart from where it came from the original plant over here will grow. And that's all that you need on a turtle head. And you can do it in bloom, you can do it in the spring. Um, like I said, you can follow the, the rule of thumb that says do the fall bloomers in the spring. So this one we're dividing in the spring, um, but we divided, I just divided it yesterday, put some out for the client. Um, in this, yeah, so here the shoots are turning up, just becoming, uh, they're below ground level. Okay. Okay, and I think I, I think we've probably let you do enough uh, today. I think we'll uh, we'll we'll say we'll say farewell and uh, and look forward to uh, to articles and check the website for for other other tips. Thank you very okay. much, Sonia, and thank you. Thank all you, of you, everybody. Who, uh, the, those of you who've hung on, it looks like there's still a lot of people that are hanging on. Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, I'll see what I can do. Let's see. Um, we will put up a question and answer session. Uh, so we'll put up a fourth chapter for this one, and in that session, without, uh, without an audience, because it'll take a little while to do it, we'll go through these plants one at a time and just show you the pictures so that you can see the pictures. Some of these are on what's coming up in articles already, some are not, but this way they'll all be in one place. Uh, generally, we're able to get the recordings up uh, for you by Monday uh, of the following the the webinar, so look for that on Monday. We send out an email to everyone who is in attendance and we'll send it out to everyone on our list this time to say you when it's up there. Cool. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate, we really appreciate uh, spending time with you. It is just great fun for us to be able to put these things together and we hope that you'll support us at gardenatoz.org. We hope you'll become a subscriber or a donator so we can keep on doing these things. A donator? So that's it for, the, for chapter three of dividing perennials. Those are the most frequently asked questions. We are going to go onward and after this uh, live presentation 
add a chapter four with the plants that we did not cover because there were so many questions in, in, in chat about so many other plants that yes. we couldn't show you all the pictures. So we will add chapter four and that way you can queue up plants and look at them there. We'll be showing the plants that were on the list that you just saw. Thanks a lot for thank joining you. us. Yes, thank you so much. And for so, supporting us. Uh, this is Janet Makanovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. And we're GardenAtoZ.org. And uh, after you look at Chapter That's 4, for, that'll be it for the Biden perennials. But join us next week for the Art of Fall Garden Cleanup. Oh, thank you for remembering that. Yes, another very, uh, very popular topic. Thank you and goodbye.